it brings us to the New Testament, brings us to Jesus. You know, we're Christians. We want to be Jesus-y, right? Jesus was a preacher of the kingdom. Okay? It's a common refrain of liberal theology to say, look, you folks, you conservatives, you know, you're, you're really creatures of Paul. Paul is your father, okay? Not Jesus. Jesus preached the kingdom, and you preach Jesus. There's a disconnect there. And you got that from Paul. Jesus didn't preach himself. He preached the kingdom. Well, on its face, that's not even true. Jesus said, believe in me. Jesus said all sorts of things about himself, but he was also a preacher of the kingdom. And it is very important, and I think it is angst among Christians to be, yeah, followers of Jesus. We need to be about the kingdom too. So it's critically important, what did Jesus mean about the kingdom? By the time, and this is complicated also, and it could go a long ways here in talking, but uh, when you follow Jesus' story, and this is an important method to do. His ministry and his presentation, he develops his understanding and his uh, meaning of the kingdom. In other words, he starts some way that is different than how he ends. We're going to skip to the end. By the end of Jesus' ministry, he has the kingdom in two phases. It is an already and a not yet. The already phase of the kingdom he introduced even in his own ministry. There in Matthew 12, 28, he makes an astounding statement. The context is uh, he's just done an exorcism, cast out a demon, and so he's done it in a very public uh, venue. And uh, his opponents are sitting there, and they're also interpreting that to work of power. And you probably recall what they think his power comes from. Uh, he's, he's head of the demons. Okay, he's like the Lord of the flies. Of course he can cast out demons. That's literally what Bazel Beelzebul means. Okay, he's Lord of the dung house. That's what they called him. Ooh, that wasn't very nice to do either, was it? Well, Jesus then in 28 tells them, no, you guys got it wrong. And he says, if I cast out demons... By the, by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God is here. And he just did it. And he is the bearer of the Spirit, so he is saying one plus one is kingdom is here. In the power of the Spirit. Luke 17 uh, is another passage about the presence of the kingdom. He says it's among you. You need to be careful about that one because he's, who did he say that to? In the context, he said it to his enemies. So he is obviously not talking about the kingdoms in your heart. They didn't have it. He's talking about his presence there. He was in their midst. That's how it's present. Romans 14, 17. Paul makes a rare statement of the kingdom in this verse, talking to the Romans. And he says, the kingdom of God is not eating or drinking. He says, these kinds of, these are peripheral things. You guys are getting all worked up about what you can do and what you can't eat and things like that. No, the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. So he again makes the link, just like Jesus. Right now, the ministry of the Spirit is something kingdom. And that's going to be important. If you want to be Jesus-y and be about the kingdom, you better get on with the Spirit. What's the Spirit here for? What are his aims? What are the things, where are the corridors where he's walking? You better put yourself in those corridors because you're wired that way. He's one of them. I mean, he's in here. So you can say, is the kingdom in me? I would say yes. The power of the kingdom is active in every believer of Jesus Christ because the spirit is there. Now, the mistake of some would be to say that's all the kingdom is, that all the kingdom meant that Jesus ever meant was just the presence of it now in power and the Holy Spirit. I think that's a mistake. I think Jesus is a good Jewish boy, and he reads his Old Testament. Well, he also wrote it, okay, right? <laughs> he knows this, and he is, he's hooked his wagon to John, who is the last of the Old Testament prophets, and he's telling the Old Testament story, and so there is a not yet of the kingdom also, the future. And Jesus' disciples in these passages here, they, are all they all indicate that they, 
they endorsed this too. They got the message. And they are awaiting for the Old Testament, what the Old Testament prophets said would be in the New Covenant. The fullness of that. Okay? Last point here. What's next? I tell my classes, this is where we're going to set the date, the second coming. So I can be one of my earlier slides there. No 2012. <laughs> no. Uh, the Bible tells us about things, plenty of things, but they are not to create fear in us, often in sensationalized things, um, you know, bunkers, hoarding, all of that kind of stuff. Uh, it's driven by a motive that Scripture says we should not be driven by. There's only one we should fear. You should fear the Lord God. You should not fear the future. You should not fear what all sorts of other things make our hearts kind of tremble at times. And that's why maybe you've heard this. Uh, fear not is the most widespread command of God to human beings in the Bible. God knows we're made, we are inclined to fear. He made us. He made us to fear something because, oh, how does that work? Because he made us dependent. We are not self-sufficient. We need air. We need things from the outside. We need psychological things, too. He made us this. He knows this. And so there's where the source of fear can be. But God says, let me be the answer to them. And that's why Jesus said in Matthew 4 to the devil, he said, man does not live by bread alone. But we live by what God provides. And he's citing an Old Testament passage there that Moses told Israel in Deuteronomy 8.3. And Moses, in the context, is what comes from the mouth of the Lord as the Lord's provision there is manna. And that was a physical provision. Don't just reduce God's answer for us just to truth. No, God has the answer for your physical needs as well as a, his created and beloved child. Fear him for that. Some principles. First principle that um, we're going to close off with here. We're going to have to close off with three principles as we look forward. We have the power of the already not, or the already working among us in the spirit. So that when you get uh, into questions of spiritual gifts, that's really a kingdom question. Okay? The fruit of the Spirit is a kingdom question because the Spirit is the power of the kingdom. When the Spirit makes us into the church, 1 Corinthians 12, 13 says, by one Spirit you've been baptized into one body. He makes you a member of the church when you get saved. That's kingdom stuff. And the resourcing the ability to learn forgiveness in the church as you work spiritual gifts to build up the church until that, that great kind of uh, rubric Paul says we're aiming at, till Christ to be formed in you. That's kingdom. That's now. That's the Holy Spirit. Three scriptural principles to leave eschatology as we look forward. Imminence. Imminence means is the idea that there's nothing holding back the move of God to finish this thing off. There is a constellation or a series of events scripture talks about in tribulation and great tribulation. Matthew 24 talks about this. Jesus talks about the signs of the end and we talk about earthquakes, famines, wars, rumors of wars and all of those sorts of things. An antichrist person. Okay. Imminence means that the beginning of that kind of clock ticking, there's nothing holding that off. Sometimes, uh, well-meaning folks, you can kind of get to the idea that uh, there's some conditions until Jesus shows up. Like, the gospel has to be preached to all the nations. That's in Matthew 24. And in some places, I know in some mission societies, they have a little clock on the wall about unreached people groups, you know, and how many, and every time some one of them gets reached, the, it, the number reduces. Well, that's kind of put a subtle condition until Jesus can't come back until we get our clock down to zero, right? In the meantime, what do we do, you know? 
Oh, it's not coming back yet. No, that's not how the New Testament folks lived. Paul talks about, James talks about the end is near, James 5. They lived that the end could be at any moment. They didn't say it was going to be in their lifetime, so they are not wrong. But they lived as if it could have been, and that is the truth of what they're talking about, how we should live. That's why you have exhortations from Paul, to work while it is still light, for night is coming when no man can work. As you motivate the purity that 1 John talked about, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding, those types of things, that could happen at any time. It could come like, you know, the thief in the night or the Left Behind series and all of the things they talk about. I still am riveted. Thief in the Night was my generation's kind of end times thing. If you saw that first one, you remember the, uh, you know, the rapture has happened and they're going through all these different scenes where people, there's the lawnmower just sitting out in the middle of the lawn running by itself. There used to be a guy behind it, okay. And or there's the, the electric razor still buzzing in the sink. That freaked me out, okay. <laughs> that freaked me out, okay. That kind of stuff. The Bible speaks about that could be at any time, the action of the Lord. So live appropriately. Don't, whatever your eschatology is, don't compromise imminence. The New Testament guys lived that way. They wrote about that. There's another principle here that will end, uh, bring us almost to the end here, is a principle of ripening. Have you ever had, or ever, maybe you've ever thought this yourself, boy, the God of the New Testament is sure different from the God of the Old Testament. I've had people tell me that. There was an old church heretic, Marcion. He built his whole theology on that. Okay? He dissed the Old Testament because the God of the Old Testament was so, he was so re retributional. Eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, that's him. He's genocidal. He sends Israel in to wipe out the babies and the animals of the Canaanites along with everybody else. No, the God of the New Testament, that's Jesus. That's Father. That's love. And you get in the extreme heretical version, these are two different gods. No, they're in the same Bible. People who usually come up with that, two different gods are victims of not having read the book of Revelation. That's the New Testament God too. In fact, that's, that's Jesus opening the seven sealed book of judgments there and pouring out seals, trumpets, and bowls by the hand of his angelic hosts. And so, then, no, oh, it's, uh, the difference is the Old Testament and New Testament is one of perspective. Why did God use Israel as an instrument at that time against the Canaanites? There's a metaphor that's used in the Old Testament, that the Canaanites were filling a cup. Their abominations, their anti-God, their idolatrous life was filling a cup of wrath. And it was filling, filling for hundreds of years, filling, and when it was at the top, God sends his, angel, his agent in, Israel, and he dispossesses them. So the cup was filling, and, and in the, New, the Old Testament, we, didn't, we aren't privy to a lot of the filling that was going on. We just saw the harvest time, or the pouring out when the cup was full. The same principle is working now. There's a cup being filled in the book of Revelation, Revelation 14, 14. You want to, might want to read that, uh, note that. It's all about uh, tribulation period there. It's talking about ripening. For the earth is ripe to harvest. In other words, Jesus hasn't come back because something's not ripe yet. What is it? If you look in that passage, 14 on to like verse 20, it's, the, it's also the ripening of wrath. So we are in the midst of watching the nations around us fill their cups. And God says, he calls what he's going to do a tribulation. The word tribulation is squeezing. Literally, it means oppressing. So God's going to squeeze something. In another vernacular metaphor, you could say he's going to kick the bucket over. He's going to kick the world's bucket over, and we're going to see what's in there. And it's going to be all on display. 
We're going to see the face of sin, the face of Satan, and the face of evil like we never have before. It's still here. That face is all around us. It's just masked right now. It's masked by education. It's masked by affluence. It's masked by nations. It's, asked, it's masked by um, being polite. Unbeliever folks can be all of those things, look quite cultured. But if they are unbelievers, the Bible says they are haters of God. They're hostile to God. They're enemies of God. It's pretty categorical in the Bible. It's black and white. You're on God's side. You're in the kingdom of light or you're in the domain of darkness, period. There's no neutral ground, no Switzerland, no, uh, you know, I missed in the gray area. I'm not involved. No. The Bible puts everyone in one of two camps. And so this time of ripening is about, we're going to see what the domain of darkness looks like. And when those things are poured out, the judgments are poured out, you get reading of stuff like hailstones mixed with fire, sores on people, famine, a quarter of the earth's water is turned to blood. That's pretty graphic language. But all of that is to, we're going to really see who people are when you strip away all the things they're putting their security in. Revelation 3.10 is an important verse here, too. He talks to the Church of Philadelphia there, I think, and he says, if you keep the word that I have exhorted you with, I will keep you from the hour of testing that is coming on all the earth to test those who dwell on the earth. He's going to test. So something's ripening now. And so I would say, why hasn't Jesus come back? I would say it's not because the earth is good enough yet. There are some who think that that's what this whole thing is working towards. I think the principle of ripening from the Old Testament to the New says the world, Jesus has not come back yet because the world is not yet bad enough. How's that for a happy ending or happy story? Okay, well, the ending is happy. Okay, and that's our last point here. The story ends with the triumph of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. He puts down through a series of battles and all sorts of geopolitical types of maneuverings that you see in Revelation and Daniel. He puts down enemies, his enemies. He leads the redeemed humanity in their vocation, ruling over sin, ruling over the adversary, until finally he throws the enemy and all of his followers into uh, the lake of fire forever and ever. And so the story is, uh, um, we had an integ integration uh, little seminar among the faculty, and I got to, with your Melissa Schubert, give a lecture. And we were talking about this. I'm talking about what I've told you. This is a story. The Bible comes to us as a story. It does not drop down from heaven like the Westminster Confession of Faith. It doesn't drop down like the Nicene Creed of the Church. No. Like, it doesn't drop down like the... No, it drops down as story. And she comes along, this was very insightful to me. She says, yes, it's a story and it's a comedy. It's not a tragedy in those classic categories. It's a comedy because it ends in a wedding. Doesn't the Bible end in a wedding? The bride of Christ is married to Christ, the bridegroom. And so it ends up and they all lived happily ever after. Okay. So there's the story that God has painted for his people. It is the fulfillment of what he made us for. It is fulfillment of his, his design to show himself off by blessing and being good to his creatures and them living the fullness of, of everything he made them for. And that's what heaven will be. And that doesn't have sin in it. And so sin has to be resolved. And the story of, that we're involved is the mastery of sin. We partake of this personally in our own lives. Sin shall not reign over you, Paul says to his new covenant Roman folks. But as a community, as churches, we are supposed to be living this type of a community to the world around us now, drawing people in. 
to this light, or rather I should say going to them with this light, being attractive to them with this life. Winsome love is our weapon now. Winsome love. Well, you've persevered to the end. Congratulations. <laughs> well, thank you. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.